Amen. Good to see. Have you leapt over something? I just heard a lot of noise. That's, wow. Um, this morning, I just need to remind you of two things. First of all, tonight at 6.15, we have Compass Meeting. I'm just saying. Compass Meeting at 6.15. And um, also, next week at 6.15, our men's ministry, which we're called Fishermen. Because Jesus said, come and follow me and I'll make you fishers of men. Our fishermen's men's ministry will meet next week at 6.15. Uh, as you leave today, there will be the places, the little black boxes on the wall, and also the men in the vestibule to receive your offerings. And we appreciate your support.
Amen. Thank you so much. Praise to the Lord. His name is wonderful. Amen. Amen. Listen, we have several folks in our choir who are sick today, and you need to be praying for them. And there's something else you can do. You can come at 5 o'clock today and take uh, a spot in the choir. We would love to have. We have a bunch of new music that we're working on. So I hope you'll come. Let's stand together as we sing, To God Be the Glory, Great Things He Has Done. To God be the glory, great things he has done. So loved he the world that he gave us his Son, who yielded his life and atonement for sin, and opened the life gate that all may go in. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord. about you but I love that song I love that last verse of that song which says great things he has taught us great things he has done and great are rejoicing through Jesus the son but purer and higher and greater will be our wonder our victory when Jesus we see now I don't know about you but it's pretty good life's pretty good right here right now it's pretty good Last night we had a great time down in the fellowship hall with a bunch of prayer partners and caregivers and deacons. And man, we had a good time. We had good food. I'm not over it yet. And it was good. It was just a great time. But greater our victory when Jesus. Can you imagine what it's going to be like just to see him? I, I love that song. I can only imagine. Will, will, I be, will I dance before you or will I be still? Will I be able to speak at all? I don't think so. You know, I love some of the Hebrew terms for God, like Jehovah Nisi, which means he is our banner. He's the banner. I love, y'all love John Wayne movies, I do. I just love, I know Joey does because he'll, he'll see, he'll watch them. And he'll watch anything that's old and Western, by the way. But, but the cavalry comes out, they've always got a banner they're flying. And most of the time, that's the flag of the United States. But our banner 
is the name of our God. Amen. The name of our God. Yes, amen. He, he is Jehovah. Some say Jireh. Some say Yiri. Yes. He is our provider. Yes. What has he not provided for us? Yes. Not one thing. Yes. Including eternal life. Yes. Including eternal life. And Jehovah Rapha. Yes. He is our healer. Yes. And I'm not just talking about healing from uh, the common cold or even COVID-19. I'm talking about he has, he has the cure. He is the healer for the sin in our lives. Yes. He is the yes. cure, yes. and we have yes. him to give. Yes. He is the great I am. shake before you the demons run and flee at the mention of your name king of majesty there is no power in Great! 
And you may be seated. Hey, and all God's people said, amen, amen. amen. I believe we could just kind of hit the rewind button and just sing that song all over again, amen. Man, what a great song. Scott, thank you for leading us so well today. So good to see each of you. Hopefully you are dry. I know it's a little, little nasty outside today, but it's good to be here. It's good to see you, and it's good to fellowship with uh, believers today. I uh, want to finish up something we started two weeks ago in Matthew chapter 16. So if you have a copy of God's Word, if you have a device that has a, a Bible app, look and find Matthew chapter 16. And we've been talking about rocks and gates, and today we're going to talk about keys. This I do know. This text tells us that the church is founded upon a great truth, and that truth is that Jesus is the rock of our salvation. I know that on June 11th, 1978, Jesus became real to me. I knew a lot of facts about Jesus. I, I grew up in a, in a Christian home. My dad, when I was seven years old, my dad was the very first person to one-on-one -on -one share the gospel with me. And so I'm so thankful for that. And, and I, I mean, I went down the next Sunday morning. So it was on a Saturday night. Sunday morning, I went down and told the preacher, his name was Randall Jones. I said, I want to be saved. Now, I had no clue what I was saying. But I had so much love and respect for my dad that I knew that it was so important to him that I thought, man, this must be something that I should do. And so I was seven years old, went down, got baptized the whole nine yards. Now, here's the deal. Nothing in me changed whatsoever. Not a thing. Because there was no drawing of the Holy Spirit, no true conviction. But on June 11th, 1978, 16-year-old punk, I'm telling you, just rotten to the core. I'm going to tell you, God did something that day that forever has changed my eternal destiny. And I know for a fact that day the Holy Spirit of God brought conviction. I saw myself as a sinner, lost, separated from God, but I saw Jesus for who he was. And I know that day Jesus saved me. And so I know that the church, this thing called the ecclesia, the, the called out ones, I know that we have a, we're, we're founded upon a great truth, and that truth is none other than the Lord Jesus himself who was not just a little bit God, part of God, a representative of God, but the Bible teaches he was very God. I don't know what you're trying to build your life upon, but if it's anything less than Jesus himself, you're building on a faulty foundation. But then we looked at not only just the rocks, and he's the rock and we're a bunch of little rocks if we know him. I know that the church is commissioned to a great task. So there's something that God calls us to. If that were not true, I really think if that were not true, the very moment that we were saved, we'd check out of here. There'd be nothing left, right? But there's so much more that God wants to do in and through his people. And so there's a great task that he's called us to. And so that task is to, to share the gospel, to be salt and to be light. But you also have to know that anytime there is spiritual advancement, there is always going to be satanic opposition. And so that's where the gates kind of come in. And so Jesus, pointing to himself, said, Upon this rock I am going to build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. So gates are not an offensive weapon. Or they're something to keep you out. And so Jesus is making a very clear statement there that it is impossible. You, you understand that Satan is nothing more than a liar. And he's come to steal, to kill, and to destroy. And so too many times we think about what he's doing instead of what Jesus has done. And we allow those gates, whatever they are, to kind of keep us from advancing where Jesus wants us to be. And Jesus makes it just really crystal clear. Those gates cannot stop the church of the living God. And so we, we can be offensive, not offensive, but offensive. 
and that we can declare the glorious gospel and to not be ashamed of that. And so Satan wants you to live under hell's authority and to rule in your life instead of being ruled by God's authority. And so, so he, he's just making it crystal clear that that gate is nothing but a bear that we get to knock down with the glorious gospel. And we don't have to live like we're in Hades or in prison, but we can live and have freedom and fullness and abundance. Hey, church, I want you to hear this today. Jesus died that you and I could have life, right? And to experience life abundantly. So... Well, I've kind of already preached some of the text already. But anyway, if you have a copy, you found your place, look with me, Matthew chapter 16. And I'm going to get you to do something I ask you to do every single week. And I'm going to ask you to stand with me as we honor the reading of God's Word. As a matter of fact, hold your Bible up and say this with me. This is the Bible. It's God's holy, infallible, inerrant, perfect, life-giving, life-changing Word. Now, when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say that the Son of Man is? And they said, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and others Jeremiah, one of the prophets. And he said to them, but who do you say that I am? And Simon Peter replied, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered him, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter, little rock. And on this rock himself I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Now look very closely at an interesting passage. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. And whatever you loose on earth shall be loose in heaven. Then he strictly charged the disciples to tell no one that he was the Christ. Lord Jesus, thank you for today. Thank you for just a sweet time of worship and just to, to sing praises to your name, to think and to concentrate today that you are the great I am. Thank you that we don't have to live under the, the rule and the domain of the enemy, but thank you, Jesus, that you came and you came to give us life and Give us life more abundantly. Thank you that we can know you, that we can bless you and praise you. Thank you that we can pursue you even today. God, you can draw us close to your side. We can learn to abide or teach us who we are in you. Teach us about the, the spiritual authority that we have in you. It's not of our own but, Lord, you allow us to be a part of this thing called the church and all of its beauty and all of its glory. And, God, thank you that we are part of your bride. And so, Jesus, today help us to truly see who we are and what you've called us to and how important it is Lord, to join you in your redemptive work in this season of our life. And so, Lord, you come and teach us through your word. And for all that you do, God will give you play, uh, praise and glory and honor for it all. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. God bless you. You can be seated. So I will end this, this whole series by, by, by just telling you that when I, I look at the keys and I think about the power of the keys, it, it tells me that the church, those who are saved by grace, called out by God, are destined to a great triumph. You, you know, last week I made a statement that we're not working toward victory, we're working from victory. The truth is we already have victory in Jesus, right? Now, we may not always live that way. Do you always live that way? Hello, is this is my mic on? Do you always live the abundant life? 
Do you always feel like you live victoriously? Well, let's just think about that for a few minutes. Why, 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 is, why is that? When, when we know that the Bible would teach us that we are destined for triumph, we're destined for victory, we're destined for abundant life and abundant living. And I think sometimes it's because we don't understand what we have. And we don't really appropriate what we have in Jesus. Sometimes I think we think far too much less of who we are in Christ than, than who, we, who we are and what we possess in Him. And so all of us understand, you know, you, you got keys, right? I almost, just, just for fun today, thought, well, I'm just going to get everybody to take their keys out and just shake them. Matter of fact, just go ahead and do it right now. Just somebody just, just reach in your pocket, purse, grab your keys, and just, just shake them. Just shake them. Just shake them. All right. So y'all understand keys, right? Now, I know, I know, some of us, we're really fancy, smancy, and we don't have keys, but we have fobs, all right? So if, if the Lord was speaking to us today the way that he was speaking to his people then and there, he, he might have said keys, but he might have said, what if he just said fobs, all right? But, but the idea, the principle is the same, right? So, so when I think about my house, I, I have a key. That's my key right there. That's the, the key to my house right there. And if I were to say, Scott, here's what I want you to do. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you my car keys. I want you to drive my car, go to, to, uh, to Columbia, and uh, here's the key to my house. And, and, and um, I need you to get something for me, okay? And so what I would do, then I would give him, I would give him, well, I'm, I don't trust you. No, I'm just kidding. All right. Uh, <laughs> I would give him my keys. Now think about this. By me giving him my keys, what I've actually done, I've given him permission and authority to drive my car. I've given him permission and authority to go in my house. Right? Now, it would, now what would you think if I go... So, so I'm thinking, well, he's not back yet. He's at my house. And so I'm going to go. And, uh, and so I go in the front door, and I say, Scott, and I don't hear anything. And I walk back to my bedroom. And what if he's crawled up in my bed? <laughs> and I look over in the kitchen, and there's dirty dishes. And I know there wasn't any dirty dishes before we left. So if I'm going to give somebody permission and I'm going to give them authority, they're going to get it what? All. All. And see, sometimes we don't like that, do we? We would question because we would say, Lord, there's some areas that I know that, that you want the keys. And I know there's areas that you would give me keys. But, Lord, I'm not sure I want to go in that room or that area or that arena. The truth is, I, that just doesn't work in this text. So first and foremost, let's just get this down big and plain, okay? If you know Jesus, then you got all of him and all that he represents right there is nothing left you've got it all the question is are you appropriating all that you've got that's a big key and so Jesus here is saying that this church this ecclesia is is destined for for victory and great triumph because he is the foundation of the church. He is the one who delegates authority. Keys are a symbol of authority and the Word of God. You can just check this out. Isaiah 22, 22. 
talks about the key of David, how it can loosen what needs to be opened and it can close what needs to be closed. This is what I know. God will open doors that no man can open and he can close doors that no man can close. Right? I mean, that's just the way God works. And so it's the idea of power. It's the idea of authority. And so in the text that the people that Jesus is speaking to, they definitely understood what he was saying. That the one who has the keys has access, which translates to authority. The keys that Jesus is talking about belong to the kingdom of heaven. And he makes that so crystal clear. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And note this, it's not just key, it's keys. Now, I do think that's interesting. One writer said it's because the, they are gates of Hades and they're plural, and that's why there needs to be keys and they're plural. Could it be that Jesus is saying for every hellish gate, there is a corresponding heavenly key. For every lie that the enemy would try to share with you, there is a truth in God's word that could overcome that lie. So I do believe that you could read that in this text. I have no problem believing that whatsoever. And so for me, in that moment, I could, I could tell you that anything that Satan would throw at you, thank God, there is a divine response. Right? So that's why you better know the Word. And that's why you got to get in the Bible and let the Bible get into you. How in the world are you going to discern what is truth and what is error unless you know the Word of God? And so there, but I, I'm thankful for that. That anything that Satan would construct or build or try to represent in my life, there is a heavenly key, a truth from God's Word that can overcome that. That means there's no problem in your life, no problem in my life, to which God does not have a response. Well, that's good. And so for some of us here today, I'm going to encourage you to stop messing with the gates of hell and start learning about the keys to the kingdom that Jesus has given you because you belong to the church. Okay? Now, do I believe that's all that that text teaches? I do not. I believe that that is one thing the text teaches. Now, you're going to have to put your thinking cap on. And I need your time and attention for about the next six minutes. Because I think there's something even deeper here in the text. Does the enemy have lies? Yes. Can God's truth overcome any lie of the enemy? Yes. But I think there's something deeper in the text. Listen closely. And I tell you, you're Peter, and upon this rock I'll build my church. The gates of hell shall not prevail against it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Now, that's an interesting thought. And that's probably a text that a lot of people have used for a lot of different things, but not exactly what Jesus intended. If you look closely at the concept that's taught here, there's something interesting about binding and loosing so if something is bound in heaven it can be bound on earth if something is loosed in heaven it's loosed on earth man what in the world is he talking about well what if we were to to use words that maybe we're more familiar with what if we use the word allowing and forbidding what if I told you there's things that heaven allows that we should allow here, and there's things that heaven forbids that we should forbid here? You with me? I, I think that's a, there's a deeper meaning here. I, I think Jesus is speaking to Peter saying, I'm going to build my church and the gates of hell are not going to stop it. And I'm going to tell you, heaven 
has already spoken about what this church is going to look like and how it's going to reflect my glory. And that's what the church needs to be a part of. So in one sense, you could say this, anything that heaven says is okay, we should say is okay. And anything that heaven says is not good, we should say it is not good. And I don't care how that fits with anybody in Columbia. I don't care how that fits with anybody in Washington. I don't care how that fits with the United Nations. I don't give a rip what that feels like with the Greenville News, Spartanburg Herald, the Wall Street Journal, or any other piece of media, CNN and NBC and whatever else, all right? <laughs> I know y'all probably watch Fox around here, right? That's what I thought. In other words, Jesus is saying, I'm going to give you the keys that can help you live with the unity of of heaven. Can you imagine that? Now listen, I know we're going to heaven one day. Amen? I mean, that's going to be wonderful and glorious. But in one sense, God is saying that you can live a little bit of heaven now. In the here, right now, we can enjoy Jesus. We can enjoy the things of God now. This can truly be a dress rehearsal for eternity. Living in concert with heaven. And God is saying, listen, I've called you to do kingdom work. And if you're going to do kingdom work, then you've got to be a part of a kingdom agenda. If you're going to be a part of a kingdom agenda, then you've got to have some kingdom equipment. And I've given you the keys to the kingdom. What a beautiful picture of living in the will of God. Maybe you would be here today and you would say, PK, I'm, I'm just not experiencing authority in my life. I'm just, I, 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 don't, I don't feel like I'm really living the abundant life. Can you help me understand why? And could it be that, that God who's called you to be light and God who has called you to be salt is trying to say to you that maybe you are hanging out with things that are dark? Things that resemble Hades and not heaven. He is saying, I've given you the power to overcome. I've given you the power to overcome the gates of hell and all the works that the enemy is trying to do. And understand, church, if we're not fulfilling our responsibility, we really can't enjoy the authority. Does that make sense? And that's why for some of us in this room today, you think just because you came to church today, you can check it off. You are really walking with God. That's not it. That's just not it. I'm telling you, if, if heaven has said no to some things, you better say no to the same things. You with me? And quit soft pelling. Quit making excuses. Quit blaming your mama, your daddy, your grandma that gave you too much red Kool-Aid when you were growing up. It's time to put on the big boy pants and big... Well, I better not say that, all right? It's time... <laughs> I just like to get in trouble. I mean so much trouble. Maybe let me just back up and say it this way. It's time to quit play church, and it's time to become the church. Now, if I take this thought to what I believe its most purest teaching, I'm going to give it to you. You ready? Here it is. Remember who Jesus is speaking to in that moment. He's speaking to who? But, but who, who is the one disciple that he's speaking to? Peter. Okay? Peter, upon this rock, I'm going to build my church. Now, you're going to be a part of it. But I will build my church. 
I will use you to do it, but I will build my church. And I'm giving you the keys to the kingdom. I'm giving you authority. And the only true authority that has never changed is the authority of Scripture. So I do believe he's talking about the Word of God. I believe Jesus is saying, anything that I teach you, it will help you understand that what needs to be bound and what needs to be loosed. And if I take that to its fullest, here's what it means. It means those people who are saved, who are born again, who've tasted Jesus, who he has birthed you into his forever family, you have been loosed. You are no longer dead. You are no longer under the domain of Hades and death. And de you, you don't have to live defeated. I've come that you might have life and have it more abundantly. You've been loosed. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. Loosed. I know I may not look like much to you, but I am born again, saved, woo, red hot, fired up, because I've been loosed. Say, Kim, well, what is the opposite? That means to be bound. Bound. Say, so what does that mean? If you're bound, that means you don't know Jesus. If you're bound, you don't have eternal life. If you're bound, you are still under the domain of Satan. And I believe in its purest, purest sense, that is what Jesus is saying to Peter. Not that he has the right to pick and choose, and look at somebody and go, well, I like you, so you're in. I don't like you, but I really like you. Okay, I like you more than I like you, to be honest with you, all right? <laughs> but you don't, no, 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 no. No. It, it's the idea that if I have been freed by Jesus, I've been loosed from my sin. I am no longer bound in my sin. I'm a new creature in Jesus. And so whatever heaven says about me, you could say about me. That means whatever heaven says about you, I can say about you. So, so, so I, Chris over here, let's say my brother Chris over here. And, and so Chris, I, one, one of the, the, to me, one of the greatest testimonies I think I've ever heard of grace, I, I, I've heard from Chris. And I love that brother dearly. And so when I hear about his transformation and how that God has saved him, I can look at that brother and I can publicly say he was bound, but now he has been loosed. Heaven has loosed him and I can acknowledge that he's been loosed. You understand? That is the purest sense of what Jesus is speaking here when he's talking about binding and loosening. Say, so Ken, just put it, put all the cookies on the bottom shelf. Um, I will. That means today I can boldly declare two truths. Truth number one if you've been saved by grace and you know that God has saved you and redeemed you, you've been loosed. But if you are here today and you've never trusted Jesus, you are still bound. Because that's what heaven says. Heaven says anybody who does not respond to my gospel, you are still bound in your sin. It does not matter how moral you are. I'm probably going to, I'm just going to go ahead and be offensive. I'm bothered that there are a lot of Christians who want people to be moral. So we sign all these petitions and 
we do all this stuff because we don't like this and don't like that and, don't, and we want everybody to think like we think and act like we act and, and I understand morality but here's the problem with that you can teach someone to be moral you can teach somebody to maybe vote a conservative way but it does not change their soul and if we're not careful we will make earth and hell Hey, I'll bring it down closer to this. If we're not careful, we will make it where this world and this area of the country that we live in, we will just make it more comfortable to go to hell from. So maybe we should spend less time about, you know, if a person's got long hair, give them a break. Who cares how long your hair is? There's only one haircut in the Bible. Right? But some of us, we, we just, oh, it just burns us up, don't it? Just burns us up. Ah, that boy needs a haircut. Ah, ah. If you love Jesus, you have a haircut like mine. Isn't that the attitude? Well, what if some folks don't have any hair? Sorry. And then makeup. I know, I, know, I know churches and pastors that just get all over makeup and stuff. Women, if they wear makeup, they're going to hell. If women wear pants, they're going to hell. I mean, my soul. I don't, I don't agree with that at all. Bless the Lord on my soul. I think if the barn needs paint, you paint it. Amen. <laughs> <laughs> y'all you you understand where i'm going with this right see we can have people looking like we look and acting like we act but if it is not jesus it won't matter right it just won't matter and so If I look at all of what I see in that one text of Matthew chapter 16, I would have to say it's all about the gospel. It's just all about the gospel of Jesus Christ. And the key question today is have you been loosed or are you still bound? Lord Jesus, today I... I can't look in the hearts and lives of people. Only you can truly do that. And Lord, you have allowed us for these three weeks just to kind of walk through this text. And we just see the beauty of the church and the beauty of the ecclesia, those who've been called out. And God, we praise you for that. Thank you that we can understand kingdom life and kingdom living and Lord, that we can, we can know you and enjoy you and be at peace with you. Lord, there, there are so many things that we just need to get over that have nothing to do with the soul of man, has nothing to do with the gospel. And Lord, I pray that all the time and attention of these legalistic things that mean absolutely nothing in eternity. That we would, we would, Lord, use the time we have and the energy, the resources that we have, life that we have right now, sowing the seeds of the gospel. That we would see men, women, boys and girls come to know you. And Lord, based on their response to the gospel, we can truly say they've been loosed. And and Lord, we can acknowledge that and speak truth to that because of the gospel. But Lord, we can also say to people who've never trusted you that they are still bound. And Lord, what we pray today is that no one under the sound of my voice today, would be bound in their sin and lost in eternity to spend forever, Lord, separated from you. 
And so, Jesus, I'm just asking you if there's anyone here today and the Holy Spirit has brought conviction that today would be the day that we would watch this, we would watch this loosening take place. And so, Lord, we give it to you. I pray for believers here today that, Lord, so many times our time and our attention is just not on kingdom life. And so, God, would you just give us a a revival of kingdom life? Would you, God, call us to a deeper walk with you? God, would you just... Help us to understand the importance of just being in your presence, of being with you, of just reading this word and knowing you. And that the true blessings of this life aren't monetary and all that. But God, to be able to to let heaven and kingdom life be a reality in our heart. Lord, for you to say to us what you said to Simon, Peter, flesh and blood did not reveal that to you. My Father in heaven revealed that to you. You are blessed. And so, Lord, this time of invitation is yours. God, you do with it what you will. And we will thank you and praise you for it. I'm going to ask you to stand to your feet. And the, the invitation is just very, very simple. If you need to be saved, come. I would love to share the gospel with you and lead you to Jesus. If this is a, a church that you believe that God wants you to be a part of, I'm going to ask you to come today. Maybe you're here today and you would just say, Ken, I have just struggled and struggled. I am so sick and tired of just being sick and tired. Then why don't you come, find a place around this altar today and say, Lord, I want to be about kingdom life. I just, I need you. Trust me. Just trust me. Just as I am without one plea, by that thy blood was shed for me, and that thou bidst me come to thee, O us we give this time to you we trust you and Lord we believe your word when it says what you begin you will see through to completion and so God for what you've begun even today I know that you will bring it to pass and so Father help us to anticipate a mighty move from you and we trust it and believe it today in Jesus name amen